So my favourite type of action games tend to be those that have a lot of depth to their mechanics, because usually more depth equals more ways to be creative equals more fun. Games like Devil May Cry and another series I'll try to avoid bringing up for once offer you a big bag full of different moves, weapons and abilities for you to rummage through and find what you like. You mess around and experiment a bit and over time come up with your own personal favourite way to play. Feeling like I manage something through my own creativity just makes me feel all smiley, so I gravitate to games that can give me that kind of feeling. Taking this thinking at face value though would imply that the opposite is also true, and that simpler games must be inherently less fun. Our little thought experiment says that fewer options provided to the player means less ways for them to be creative, and therefore sad face. Playing 5 minutes of Tetris can help illustrate how that is complete nonsense, and it's sometimes even the case that imposing restrictions can encourage creativity. But I still find that thinking this way can be a very easy trap to fall into, especially when you're thinking about action games. For example, why would you choose to play Fury instead of playing Metal Gear Rising? They're both action games offering thrills through a combat system based around a sword wielding cyborg. They've both got brilliant soundtracks that you'll be happy to slot into your playlists once you're done with the game. The most memorable moments of both are the boss fights, although in Fury's case that's because it's nothing but boss fights. Superficially they have a lot in common, but while Metal Gear Rising has all sorts of varied combo moves and different weapons you can unlock, Fury only offers up 4 simple actions. You can do a 3 hit combo with your sword, you can shoot a laser gun, you can parry, and you can dodge. I'd known about the game for a while, but because it seemed simpler and therefore potentially less fun than other titles, I always ended up drifting towards something else instead. But after playing through it and enjoying myself the entire time, I can definitively say that was a pretty dumb thing to do. So today I wanted to talk about why I enjoyed the game in the hopes that anyone who landed into the same brain traps as me might give it a chance, and also end up having a similarly fun time. The term underrated gem gets thrown around so much you'd expect the third page of Steam to redirect you to De Beers, but for once I think it might actually be an appropriate phrase to use. This video isn't aiming to be a comprehensive review where I list a bunch of pros and cons. I more wanted to explore how the game managed to create a system that let me play the way I did and therefore enjoy the experience in the way I did. Given that I'm pretty sure I'll have some people saying I played it wrong, that approach might not be for everyone. But if I'm going to make a video about a game 6 years too late, I figure something a bit different might make this whole endeavour a bit more worthwhile anyway. Before my pants really start to catch, I should probably mention that I just lied to you a minute ago. Most of your 4 basic actions can be charged to give a different effect, extending your toolset to something like 7 possible actions instead of just 4, depending on how you want to classify some of the variants. I omitted this extra variety earlier because 1 I thought it'd be funny, and 2 because I wanted to take you on the same journey I went on when discovering that the game has more depth than it first appears. It might take a little time to notice, but creativity is absolutely achievable and is even actively encouraged, with all sorts of different possibilities presenting themselves across the different bosses. For example on this guy, I realised that trying to stab him would trigger a counter attack, but after seeing that I realised I could try and parry that counter attack. If I didn't like something he was doing, I could just go on the offensive to trigger this behaviour, breaking him out of whatever action he was trying to do and shifting control of the fight from him to me. If you treat learning how to avoid damage from an attack as a problem, then there's usually multiple actions you can input as the solution. For example, you'll probably want to try and dodge out of the way of most projectiles, but there's nothing stopping you from trying to parry them instead. So even though you are given a somewhat limited toolset, the game presents enough varying situations for you to use it in some unique and creative ways. And that's really one of the greatest strengths of keeping things simple. It seems to have let the devs explore and understand all the possibilities the game could generate, therefore allowing them to design everything in such a way that all those possibilities do actually get experienced over the course of a playthrough. What might appear to be restrictions at first actually help them push all creative avenues to their limits. By the end you feel as though you've seen and done everything the system can offer you, which gives a sense of completeness that's sometimes absent in other titles. But even with this extra hidden depth, there's still a pretty glaring issue in this recommendation. Most other action games still have more depth. Something like Devil May Cry or Bayonetta can give you everything I just described and then some, so I've still not completely solved my original issue. This is where I completely changed gears because the reason I enjoyed Fury so much was because I pretty much ignored all the system's potential and fully embraced the simplicity. I ended up treating it kinda like a rhythm game, 
where every boss was a sequence of attacks I would overcome by pressing the right input at the right time. I'd do simple dodges and simple attacks, not really thinking too hard about how I could exploit and use the system creatively. I let it come to me and I just reacted. Saying that bosses are all about pattern recognition and exploitation is about as basic game design analysis as you can get, but I still figured it was worth saying out loud because it's the concept at Fury's core and the reason I was able to play it like this. The benefit of a simple moveset is that the designers can assume that you the player can figure out what action is best to perform in a given situation and then press it in a short amount of time. You're not burdened by having to weave dodges into complicated combos or anything like that. And knowing that lets them speed up the pace of the game so that the recognition and exploitation dance ends up happening much more frequently than in some other games. You've probably already noticed that Fury is pretty fast. And I'm aware that in some of these clips there's probably so much shit on the screen that it might be hard to even work out what you're seeing, let alone how you'd go about avoiding damage. With the controller locked firmly in your sweaty gamer grip however, it is a lot easier to understand that every attack has a pattern you can learn and some action you can perform to overcome it. The bits that kind of break this mould are those sections that pull inspiration from the bullet hell genre. And yeah, sometimes in these parts, it does feel like just dumb luck that you managed to avoid getting hit, instead of something that you intentionally did. But overall, the number of truly random projectiles are actually pretty low. It's not always perfect, but the majority of attacks are all designed to have a clear way to avoid damage, which is what let me treat it more like a challenge to press the right input at the right time, and hence the comparison to a rhythm game. But you might ask, one, why is that fun? And two, doesn't that get old really fast? The answers to which kind of come from the same place. All the Fury's bosses have multiple stages, with each one bringing changes and tweaks to spice things up. Sometimes the changes can be relatively small, like the introduction of a few different attacks, and sometimes they can be more drastic, like turning the game from 3D to 2D. Whatever happens, each one of those health bars hints that something new is just around the corner. I've kind of answered the second reason first with that explanation, in that it doesn't really get old because there's so much variety, with no one particular thing sticking around unchanged for too long. It ties back to earlier when I described how the game had all this extra depth that might not be immediately obvious, but understanding how this stage structure works also helps explain why this design makes for a fun experience. Something I maybe should have mentioned earlier is that Fury is a pretty tough game, and you'll probably end up failing on some bosses more than a couple of times while you try to figure out what their shtick is. Repeating the same content over and over again could get a bit frustrating, but a good sense of challenge is pretty important for enjoyment in this case. Having to really use your head and practice to learn how to overcome something makes it all the more satisfying when you actually manage it. It's a major reason people love hard games like the From Software titles. But while combat in those games is slow and methodical, in Fury, everything is fast. If you get stuck on a boss's last stage and keep getting punted back to the start again, you'll eventually become so skilled at reading all those prior stages that you'll completely blast through them. A stage that previously took you 10 minutes to overcome will inevitably become one that you beat in under a minute. And it's nothing short of very enjoyable to absolutely smash through something that you once found incredibly difficult. I've never really been interested in speedrunning myself, but I imagine one of the draws is the enjoyment you get from proving your absolute mastery over a game. Fury wants to give you that feeling too, but here instead of the journey towards it taking hours and hours of practice and perfection, it happens on a micro scale every few minutes. There's a boss who has a great line that perfectly sums up the experience it's going for. After kicking your teeth in, he'll say, Excellence is not an art, it's pure habit. We are what we repeatedly do. But when everything is simple and fast paced, you never really have to repeatedly do anything for a particularly long time. Excellence is constantly achievable on a small scale, be it a particular attack, a particular stage, or even a particular boss. The variety present is then what enables this repeating mastery loop to avoid feeling stale, but it's also important to note that the success is also partly because nothing changes too much. Melee swings will always have the same white shine and noise cue as a tell, allowing you to easily recognise when they're coming and when you should parry. The timings and follow-ups might be different, but by keeping some consistency your prior experience and practice can still be put to good use, creating a sense of progression and mastery throughout the whole experience. If you had to relearn everything from one boss to another, you could still feel satisfied by mastering any particular one, but you'd lose that important feeling of progression at the macro level. And that's really why I enjoyed the game so much. Just like how it's satisfying to learn all the right inputs for a tough song in Guitar Hero, it was satisfying to learn all the right inputs for a boss in Fury. 
The added benefit of being an action game is that it can mix things up more. You might learn the correct pattern to easily beat a particular boss's stage, but the order they perform their attacks and actions can be completely random, helping the encounters to feel less repetitive. The other major reason this style of play was so enjoyable was because of the aesthetics the game offers up to you. If you played through the entirety of Elden Ring with the same weapon and approached every boss by doing nothing but roll and use your standard light attack, you'd be playing it in a similar way to how I played Fury. I would personally find that to be boring as shit though, because the reason it works for Fury is because of the colours, music and style that all mesh together as a backdrop for it. If you played Guitar Hero on mute and on a purely blank background, it wouldn't be nearly as enjoyable because a big part of the illusion would be broken, and I've got the same kind of thing with Fury. It gave me the same sort of feeling as a Platinum Games title, and sure enough in the credits there was this very sweet paragraph thanking all their favourite influences. A lot of their mentions are known for expertly capturing a feeling that can only be described by the most academic terminology available. They're really cool and dropping Fury's basic framework onto a cool background was the key to me being able to enjoy it in the way that I did. I was a bit conflicted about writing this from the optics of comparing Fury to other action games. It's not really fair to go around comparing things like this, as if a game that doesn't top other titles must not be worth playing. Not every game we play has to be a masterpiece, but I have to admit that when time and money is a bit tight, I can end gravitating towards spending on things I know will be worthwhile. You can miss a lot of fun experiences thinking that way though, and I bet I'm not the only one who overlooked Fury in favour of a similar game that I assumed would be more worth my time. So if you like the sound of something I said here, then I'd recommend you give it a try. It's not a masterpiece and it won't blow you away, but it will easily keep you well entertained for a few hours. And sometimes, that's really all you need. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.